everybody. It's good to uh, to have you all on. And uh, hope you're all having a good day. This is going to be a pretty tongue in cheek uh, approach to data migration failure. Um, something that we're going to try and avoid. Um, but if you do these uh, these things that you can be guaranteed to uh, have a data migration failure. So let's start off with uh, just the agenda, just a quick high level overview. Over the next 45 to 50 minutes, we're going to have a very quick look at what project success looks like. And then we're going to talk about the six and a half steps to guaranteed migration failure. Then we're going to have a quick overview of our, our DQ Studio, um, what its capabilities are, um, some migration use case examples to uh, set a kind of context, a quick demo of a DQ Studio product, and then any questions. But there will be some uh, intermissions, guys, so uh, feel free to jump in. Um, and ask any questions. I guess Emma will pick those up and uh, give us the nod. So, what does project success look like? Well, from the research from this uh, Project Management Institute, we have some very interesting insights of successful projects. 31% don't meet their goals. 43% exceed their budget. And 49% are late. So these are the successful ones. So I hate to think what the unsuccessful ones are. So why do we get this, these, these failures? Well, we're going to go through the six and a half steps now. And this is one that may be familiar to some of you. It's really not figuring out what the business wants. So there's the, uh, the how, how the tree swing got made kind of example. Um, you might have seen this before. The swing there with the three uh, the three seats on it, which is what the project sponsor wanted. The project manager wanted uh, three ropes. It was designed by the architect. Um, it was never going to work. How it was pro produced, and actually what the customer wanted was a rubber ring. So not dissimilar to some of the projects that I'm sure many of you have seen in the past. So what should you do? Well, if you want it to be another failure, then do not consider the business value. Do not consider the business objectives. And certainly don't decide on the outcomes you want, because if you had those, you might be able to measure against them, which would be an awful thing. So businesses really want, in, in my opinion, they want to typically increase revenue by X percent in Y period. They want to reduce waste, you know, reduce human touch points. Um, and we all know the best way to make money is to stop wasting it. So we really want some efficiencies. Clearly mitigate risk, so better processes, better uh, assurance that uh, we're going to be compliant with regulation and reduce the costs, of course. And the prize for doing these things will be optimized resources, more productive employees, improved customer relationships and enhanced market positioning and uh, branding. So I think these are worth uh, these are worth not doing if you want to uh, if you want to ensure failure. So step two do not know where you are and don't know where you're going. So again, a familiar old story to, to some of you, I'm sure. It's uh, Alice in Wonderland asking the Cheshire cat where she should go. And when he asks, well, it depends where you want to go. Um, and she replies, well, I don't, I don't really care. I, I don't know where I need to go. And he then says, well, it doesn't really matter which road you take then, does it? So similarly, um, I think of the London Underground where people say well i want to go somewhere and you can find where they are on the on the map they might want to go to tottenham court road or um green park or wherever it might be but when you say well where are you they they don't really know so on this migration project if you don't know where you are you'll certainly never be able to figure out where you're going so in the context of migration the first steps have got to be measurement so you've got to know where you are on the map before you can go somewhere and typically in a, in a project that would mean data auditing or data profiling, where you're going to discover the most uh, occurring values, the oldest dates, newest dates, you know, the whole range that data audits and data profiles have. So for a bit of fun, I thought we could uh, data profile maybe the first name. So the most occurring male name in the last hundred years would be James or female Mary. The most popular middle name would be John or Patricia. And the most popular last name is Wang. But oddly, James John Wang and Mary Patricia Wang are not particularly common. 
So uh, it's interesting how when you play with the data, you've got to uh, analyze it a little bit to be sure of what you've got. So the learning here really is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So ensure you know where you are, you know where you're going, and then you can plot your path. So step three on our journey is assigning and agreeing ownership. And some of you may know this Swiss cheese model, which uh, typically indicates where there are holes through which process steps might fall. So we have a, a story here about uh, four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. And there was an important data migration job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. So I think that's probably familiar to, uh, to people. It's been a common thing on, on many projects. So who does own this process? Um, well, often I've heard people say, well, in the database, it's got to be IT. Um, in the data content, it's got to be marketing or sales for content, acquisition, maintenance, management, et cetera. But this creates big gaps for the data migration buck to fall through. So who is it? Who is responsible? Well, a bit like the, uh, the story, it's really everybody. I think everybody has a place to play in this process. And we must make people aware of their place to play um, otherwise, we are going to fail. So if you want to fail, ensure that you do not assign and agree ownership. Step four on our journey, do not consider the obstacles. And there are many that we can, uh, we can fall foul of. And the first one here might be leadership, where if we want to ensure failure, we need to ensure that we don't have executive buy-in. Um, that they don't move fast when, when the situation changes. Um, we need to have them commit to the direction. They need to inspire the, the team. And I think be humble along the way is, uh, is, a, is an important uh, quality of, of leadership. From a communication point of view, whatever you do, don't use common language. That would uh, surely that would be too simple and people might understand what you're talking about. Don't challenge assumptions because then you'll keep on doing what you're doing and keep on getting the same result. Um, please don't uh, consider or remain open minded. That would be a terrible thing to do if you want the project to succeed. So let's move on to another one, which is data. Um, we're going to be a bit more on this later on. But my tip here is to imagine or not to imagine, actually, because uh, we're in the negative mode. Do not imagine you're a piece of data being migrated without the due care required. And then don't imagine what havoc you'll be reaping um, for revenge for being mistreated and abused in the, uh, in, sorry, in the migration process when somebody wants to use you, this piece of data, down the line. So a bit of fun. Imagine you know, the, uh, the impacts and the downside of this damaged data, let's say. Okay, so next one up, time scale. Don't know your targets. Sorry, commercial. Beg your pardon. Got the wrong uh, the wrong sequence there. Don't invite identify the value of your good data. Um, don't know what the value or the cost of the bad data is going to be as well. So the commercial impacts of getting this migration wrong. So that really needs to be considered. From a time scale point of view. You wouldn't want to be realistic about the timescales. You wouldn't want to build in any safety factors and just keep on burying your head in the sand and pretend you don't know what you don't know and, uh, and, and don't do any refactoring when uh, new things come up. From a people standpoint, I think actually the most important part of all in this process, all the rest uh, can certainly be managed and dealt with. But you know, if you're going to uh, have a failure around the people side, make sure that you don't know what the users uh, are focused on, don't know what their needs are, and don't listen to them. Um, I think the problem is that some people need a good listening to sometimes rather than a good talking to, and we're better off listening um, intently and trying to use that well-known ratio of two years, two ears and one mouth, and use them in that ratio as we're uh, as we're going through these projects. It's challenging, 
that has to be done. From a process point of view, finally, um, we want to ensure that we don't know the details, that we don't use any methods, we don't uh, focus on effectiveness over efficiency, we don't optimize flow, and we don't do more with less. So these are uh, important factors. Um, we, we could look at the technical aspects as well, um, not on this slide actually, but you know you need to be thinking fast, you need to be agile obviously, you need to use appropriate tools, be pragmatic and, and use standards. So that's step four. So coming to our uh, fifth, six and six and a half steps. Step five, do not consider your common migration challenges. And I bet there's some uh, some stories from the audience or from the floor that we could have here. Um, in relation to people, um, if we want to fail, let's let's not drain them of their knowledge over the years of the data challenges. Let's not agree the requirements and uh, let's not all have a common purpose that we can all get behind. From a data quality point of view, whatever you do, do not improve the quality uh, before, during or after migration, because whoa, that could be a that could that could cause success and we wouldn't want that now. Um, Make sure that you've got your source and map, source and target mappings well defined, agreed, and documented. Likewise, your data transformation rules. Um, you wouldn't want to define, agree, or document those either. Do not link your IDs back to your source systems once you've written to the target, because you know if you did that, you you wouldn't be able to rerun processes again or know where data had come from um, if you had made any form of mistake. Um, Make sure that all the GUIDs and lookups are completely messed up because uh, that, that really helps with the migration process. Um, that's a, a common problem. Um, migration sequence. Make sure that you don't do it in the right order um, because that will create havoc as well. In terms of the speed of migration, um, there are things to think about, not just the migration speed, but the scoping, the configuration, the reworking, testing, etc. Those all need to be factored in because if we don't consider those we're in for, in for a, a troubled project. Um, don't preload the users because, of course, uh, you can then, of course, lose their uh, their activities, histories, and anything that relates to a user, um, email notifications, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so moving on, uh, make sure that you lose the connections. Um, make sure that your targets are not of the same structure and format, so that you miss attributes and entities, and Whatever you do, run plugins in migration, that will really help. Um, do not manage the data deltas. Don't think that anybody might be using a, a system live while you're migrating. So uh, ensure that you forget to do that. Um, don't consider mastering the data because why would you want improved data in your target system? Um, that, would, that would create clarity and help people have a better business. Whatever you do, don't think about my integration, the factors after the after the event. So you've migrated your data and it's been integrated. And of course, do not document our, uh, our favorite. So step six on our journey, um, don't use tools. Whatever you do, don't use any form of methodology or process. I mean, why would you want to use what's worked before in other systems for other customers, for other projects? Don't use collaborative software. Um, that would that would definitely um, ensure you had success. So why would we want to do that? Don't audit your data and find out what uh, values you've got. Know where you are so that you can know where you're going. Um, don't use any other experience. I've never said so many don'ts in a presentation in my life because uh, I try not to say don't, but it's interesting. Uh, don't don't think about don't. That's an interesting uh, paradox, isn't it? Um, don't use any form of maps, data value maps, any mind maps, any any drawings, imagery that might uh, you know make it easier for everybody. And in this case, don't use migration tools. For goodness sake, code it all yourself from scratch so that uh, should it all go wrong, then you can unpick it and try and remember what happened three months ago. So those were our six steps. So what is our six and a half step? Well, it's really don't do these things by halves. It's you must figure out what the business wants. You must know where you're going. You must assign and agree ownership. You must consider the obstacles. You need to consider the common data migration challenges as we've seen before. And I believe you need to use tools. 
So that leads us on to potentially a little discussion around some tools before we go and have a demo. So any questions at this point from anybody? No problem, we'll push on. So DQ Studio, we're going to quickly discuss what this is all about from a migration point of view. It's our all-in-one data management engine. It helps people with integration or migration, which is what we focus on here. Uh, data quality improvement, of course, data cleansing, replication, governance, and master data management. And of course, finally, process automation. So how does it hang together? Well, like uh, many of the, uh, the Microsoft product stack, we have uh, over 130 connectors to various sources and targets, including the dynamic stack, uh, where we can also go onto the common data model, or should I call it something else, uh, the Dataverse. And now uh, bringing data in to our DQ Studio application, we're able to master our data deal with batch processing or online lookups and call out to our DQ on demand API services to do all kinds of data enrichment, suppression, enhancements, etc., which I will describe very, very briefly in a moment, and then process that data and send it to wherever it needs to go. So DQ on demand, real quick, is a, a set of services or multiple services that allow you on a credit-based model to do things to your data. So around this stack, I won't go through those one by one, but you can enrich, suppress, enhance, validate format, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so some quick examples, because uh, I'm conscious of time. Uh, here is one where we worked with a company who had seven ERP systems all going to their single CRM. So we had seven ERPs being picked up by our DQ Studio app, going to, to Dynamics, and they required us to search into Dynamics before adding the records. So we would bring these seven ERPs, go and search into CRM record X, Y, and Z, and then we would find the ERP record and associate. So ERP A goes to X, B to Y, C to Z, Z, et cetera. And then of course we had to write back to the ERP systems, those IDs that related to the CRM, and then likewise, of course, link them so that in the future they could be associated uh, without using fuzzy logic they could be used by linking the ids together so that was a, a simple migration example of seven erps multi-millions of records on a, a daily basis where we go back with, with studio to look and see where the uh, the date time change has happened here and insert data or update or review in here Quick hospitality use case um, where we actually had two uh, two projects that were that we went through. Uh, it's a hospitality scenario. It was an Oracle hospitality system. Uh, the data was migrated into SQL Server initially. We applied DQ Studio, took multi-million records, standardized, validated, formatted, linked, etc., and inserted those into Dynamics um, for the client. Then, having done that, we moved to a second stage where we actually set up a, an ongoing process where arguably they were migrating data, but it's more of an integration where actually data was being moved from their system. It was being lifted in fact by an enterprise service bus going to our APIs, in this case, cleanse, search and master. The data was first cleansed, given back to the ESB. The ESB then says, okay, I want you to go and do a search, go and search into dynamics and see if the records exist. Depending on what we found, whether it could be inserted, updated, or reviewed, we would master that data to create a golden record. Where there was ambiguity, they would be sent off to the Perfect and Merge application, where they would be reviewed in a multi-review uh, screen, and then allow them to update that data. And that is then sent back to the hospitality system so that these systems are now in sync with each other uh, on an ongoing basis. So any data change in dynamics, any data changed over here goes through the same orchestration with our API stack here. And what did that do for them? Well, it of course gave them their single guest view. 
they're now able to do RFM scores, although uh, there's a bit of a challenge in the hospitality sector, as you know, because it's been shut down for such a long time. Um, it does allow them to better serve their guests when they can come to the uh, to the to the hotels, have a better experience, and enable greater greater retention. So that is a quick uh, drive-by on on the capabilities, and now I'm going to hand over to Luke to do a quick demo. Over to you, Luke, if you are there. Yeah, I'll just share my screen. Thank you. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Yep. Cool. Okay, so this is our DQ Studio product powered by App Rules. <clears throat> so its underlying application is App Rules, and we have embedded all of our data quality expertise into the application. So as it, like you saw on Martin's slides, there are well over 130 connectors. So if I have a, let you guys have a quick peruse through them. So we get anything from accounting systems to big data, uh, cloud systems for like Azure, um, collaboration systems like Slack and Salesforce Chatter. Uh, obviously the big important one for you guys is CRM systems. So we've got Act, uh, Dynamics, NetSuite, Salesforce, and a few others. Uh, Jira, Zendesk for support service. Uh, relational databases such as SQL Server, Postgres, um, Microsoft Access, if you're in that kind of era, uh, even data warehouses such as Snowflake, and many, many, many others, obviously ERP systems as well from Mike Martin's use case earlier. So this, this list is ever expanding, and I'm currently using a slightly older version of the software because I don't have it installed at home. <laughs> But so the newer version has even more connectors like this, including the common data service connector. So that's not shown here, but it is included in the, the most recent version. Uh, and we've even got marketing systems such as HubSpot and Marketo. So it, it covers basically every use case you could need. And the best thing about this software is that it communicates with all of these systems using SQL Server as the syntax. And it will then convert that SQL Server syntax into whatever is appropriate for that system. So obviously Dynamics uses Fetch XML, whereas Salesforce uses Sockel. So inside of the DQ Studio software, you only use SQL Server notation to communicate. So as long as you know basic SQL, you can communicate with all of these systems, regardless of whatever expertise you would need ordinarily. So it makes migrations very simple. So right now, I've only got, uh, we're going to be focusing on, uh, we're not focusing, on, we're only using SQL Server for this demonstration, but it's communicating exactly the same because they all have a standard layout through all the connectors. So what you've got here is on the toolbox here, this is where you interact with your connectors. So in this case, we've got Dynamic Serum open. So it's got the same set of activities for each connector. So inserting records, updating records, replicating the system, uh, map and set, which I'll go into in a minute, uh, lookups, uh, initialized sources, initialized targets, source from queries, where you can build custom queries to do that. But all of that we will go through in a moment. So I say the best thing is that, like I said, all of these use the same. So if I open SQL Server, we've still got the same set of activities. So it doesn't matter what system your client is using, you can connect to it just the same, and your workflow's designs will be just the same. So it makes it very easy to work with all of these multiple systems that can have no relation to each other whatsoever. So if we now go through the cleanse workflow, so like I said, we're using SQL Server for this demo. So I've just got SQL Server Management Studio here. So I've got four records here that I will be running my demo on. So we first thing we do is going to open our source and targets to that system. So like I said, this is obviously in here it's using SQL because it's you would expect it's a SQL connection. But this is exactly the same generation, regardless of the system. And we can go in and choose what fields we want. If we only want certain fields, we can choose top end. We can use no lock for the systems that support it. We can add virtual fields and sortings, and we can also define filters. So App Rules has two ways of defining a filter. You can either use the standard filter building here, where you can use the add or logic and use all your operators, or you can just do a free form SQL filter if you are so inclined. And then you can come out and you can see what it just built like I showed you before. So you can make sure that if you use the filter builder, it has built what you were expecting. And then you can do a record count to just make sure you're, if you know already what you're expecting to receive, you can double check that. Uh, what we'll do then is we'll run through the cleanse. So we're going to look through those four records. 
We're going to derive an ISO from the country and phone. We're going to format the URL. We're going to format that email address. We're going to format the phone number to international standard. And we're going to format the postal code to whichever country we have derived. We're then going to generate some phonetic tokens, which allow us to match. So in this case, we're using our custom in-house uh, DQ phonetics algorithm, but we also support uh, open source ones such as uh, Metaphone or SoundX and a few others. Uh, and then we're going to do some data transformations to also aid further in data matching. Uh, after that, we're going to do an, the map and set activity, which I raised earlier. So if we have a look at that briefly. So from here, this allows us to choose what fields go to where. So in this case, we, we they have the same source and target structure between our SQL tables, so it's, it doesn't really make a difference. But it's very, very useful for when you're migrating from on-premise CRM or from a source CRM to a new CRM, because inevitably when you move to a new system, you're going to change it slightly with things you've learned across the years. So the, the structures are very likely to be different. And so here you can choose actually account name has now been completely renamed and it's now just name and I can go and choose that what source or I can do conditions so if it's a, a customer customer record then I want to do it if it's a supplier or a provider then maybe I want to move it to a different field all of that can be done from in here choosing conditions and everything else and I will show you the result of this map and set in a minute I've got a, a viewer set up Another nice thing, so like I said, I'm on a slightly older version, but the, la the latest version, you can also use CSVs to define all of this. If you've already gone through with your customer and defined your field mappings from source to target, you can just open this and upload it and it will automatically input it for you. You don't have to go through and do your 700 fields that you've got on your table. <laughs> and vice versa, you can also use the auto map functionality. So if your fields are in fact the same, then you don't have to do anything. You can just choose it to auto map and it will go and update everything because they're all the same. You don't need to do anything. I don't want to make changes. Uh, and then after I've done that, I'm just going to insert it into my intermediary table. So for the purpose of the demo, I'm using an intermediary table just because I don't want to uh, change my source data for demoing the next time around. But in the real world, obviously you wouldn't need to use a staging table. You can do it on the fly. So if we run through this quickly. So, so in this case, well, I've got viewers enabled. Obviously in the real, when it's actually functioning, you wouldn't have these viewers because that would slow it down and you have to have someone there doing it manually. So you can disable the viewers for when you're actually running the process. So in this case, this record didn't have a phone number, so we didn't do anything. The email had two out symbols, so we removed one to make it valid. The website was invalid because HTTP backslash, where it should be forward slash. Uh, the postal code, we added a space in, in the correct space for the UK postal code syntax. And for the names, we had Martin Doyle, spelled correctly, and the tokens were OKBU OK, and NO. Uh, the address, we didn't need to do anything for our data cleansing rules, and DQ Global Limited, we removed the limited from that because that is part of our one of our transformation lists. We have a load of company data that allows us to more likely get the actual company name and remove any of the gump that comes with it, like countries, limited, LTD, etc. So and then go through. Like I said, this is the result of the map and set. So we can see actually what happened. If you've got conditions, this is very useful for debugging and ensuring that what you've set up is correct and working as you expect. So you can actually see what is the result and what will be put into that field. We go and continue. Oh, this is what I'm inserting. And then that's inserted. So if we go and check in my staging table, I now have one record. So we go and click again. So this time the phone number, we did have a phone number and we did format it to UK or sorry to the international format. For the email, we had the classic Outlook syntax where it's you've just someone's copy pasted out of Outlook and you've got the, the name followed by the pointy brackets. So in this case, we've removed the name and the brackets and we've just got the email. Uh, this time for the postal code, we've removed the unnecessary space. And now it's a correct UK syntax. And Martin Doyle spelt very differently than last time, still generates the same phonetic tokens, meaning we can potentially match these as duplicates. And then again, LTD has been removed and four meter away got condensed to the number four rather than the word, because that's the rules I had set up. Uh, so I just quickly skip through the rest of these because I know time is running out. And then we can have a quick review of the records in SQL side by side. Right, so we're going to have a look at the SQL. So we can see we now have four records. So Martin Doyle, uh, I can't 
can't make that a bit bigger, unfortunately. That's possibly a bit small for you guys. But we've got Martin Doyle, Martin with a Y, and Dale, Martin with an A, and Doyle without an E, and Martin with an A, and Doyle spelt correctly. If we scroll along to the Phoenix tokens over here, all four of those records, even though they are spelt horribly differently, all generated the same phonetic tokens, meaning we can match them. Uh, all of them generated the same DQ Global account name because our phonetic rule, uh, our, sorry, our transformations in our story of limited LTD, and if we have PLC, etc. Uh, for email, we all have now the same email. The phone numbers were corrected. And if I add in the source data as well, we can uh, compare. So the emails, we had Outlook and mostly double ats. Those are all corrected. For the countries, we generated those, or we converted those to long form countries rather than ISO codes. Uh, and postal codes were all corrected, even though we had a P0, which is invalid, a PO space, which is invalid, and a cassinated, which is valid, but we wanted the space. Uh, so that's all the cleansing. Does anyone have any questions or concerns so far? No? Cool. So we'll move on to the master record side of the world, where we're going to find our best records. So briefly walk through the workflow before we run it. So the first thing we're going to do is define our rules that we will use for this master record. This is undoubtedly the most difficult part of any deduplication job because you need to work with the customer to understand their data sets before you can run any deduplication because an email may or may not be important to them for their company and their workloads. So for this, we've only got a few demo rules set up. So we've got a few different rules groups. So we've got one set of rules for best records. We then define a different set of rules for each field that we will, we want to be merging and mastering on that record. So we just have a quick look through the best record rules. So in this case, if it, if it has an email, we're going to give the record 10 points. If the last name is specifically Doyle, we will give it 20 points, and if it's the newest record, we're going to give it 50 points. Alternatively, we do have, well, we have a whole host of rules. I won't go through them all now, but we have things such as most populated record, most populated field, most common value on a field, all the kinds of things that make it very, very easy to find what is the best record. Uh, so I won't go through the rest of those because they're all fairly similar. We're then going to initialize an in-memory group to hold these records temporarily. We're then going to find a record that we will use for matching. If, see, in the real world, you wouldn't be just picking one. You're going all versus all or all versus a select of the last year or so. And in this case, I'm just doing one record, which I will match against just for speed. I'm then going to go and find some matching records using the phonetic tokens. And then going to run our scoring module, which we've built inside of the Aprils product, which allows us to go and score these records to find more accurate matches and allow us to decide at what point a similarity defines a match or a not match. So in this case, I've got it between 60 and 70 is ambiguous. Less than 60 is not a match and more than 70 is a confirmed match. Again, all of that is customizable. Uh, we're then going to go and exclude any records that are not matched or ambiguous. Uh, if you have the Perfect Merge product, you could send the ambiguous records off to Perfect Merge to be reviewed by a human. In this case, I'm not using that, so I'm just going to do nothing with them and only deal with the matched records. After that, I'm going to apply my best field, my best record rules. <clears throat> I will then apply the best field rules, and we can then have a look at the result of that before we push it out to a map and set and into our output table in SQL. So in this case, it would go into the output table, which is currently empty. So if we run that, so this is the source record I've got, so record ID 1, and it's going to be using the phonetic tokens OKBU OK, and NO, which we've already seen. They're all the same on all four records. So we go through. These are the four records we found. We're then going to go and run our scoring. So for the rules and the groupings we defined, we had record 4 got 61%, and so is ambiguous. Record three was a 98% match, and record two is identical as far as we can tell for the rules we defined. So now we're going to go and remove the ambiguous record because we're not dealing with those in this demo. So that has now been removed, and we've only got these three records which we need to go and merge together and master them. So next up, we are going to see that this record two was defined as our best with 60 points. Now, like our rules defined, we had the newest record gets 50 points, and this is the newest at 2013 rather than 2001 or 2005. 
We have then got 20 points for the last name, specifically Doyle, which is why this one got 30, because it had specifically Doyle. And then if an email was populated, it got 10 points. And all of them had an email, which is why they all have at least 10 points. But record two got the highest score, so it's the best. Then you have to move on. Uh, this is just viewing the output of that. We're then going to start applying our best field rules. So in this case, city was the best field, or, or Leon Solent was the best city value. Uh, Doyle was the best last name. Uh, Martin was the best first name. Director was the best job title. It already had the best phone number, so we don't need to do anything. Uh, Digi Lower Limited was the best company name. And that was this viewing the final record, so that's the output. So record two, this is the current data that we will be pushing out, or in this case, we would be left with after we've deleted record one and record three. So we're now going to go and output this using the map and set activity again into our SQL Server table. So if we now go into SQL, we can see that we have one record here with director as the job title, Leon Sloan as the city, the same phone number, uh, Martin Doyle spelled correctly. So as you can see from our journey here, we've then got four very different records, which we have then cleansed to see that actually these four very different records are actually very similar. We've then gone through, and although this one is from the USA, it is obviously a different record. We did not handle that in this record because we just deleted it. It's not relevant to us for this demo. Uh, and we then pushed our mastered record into the output database. And in the real world, that could either be updating it back to your source system or pushing that out to your target after you've finished all the mastering. So that way your target is then a clean database that you can work with and start doing all of your sales insights or single customer views, et cetera. So I hope that gives you a very brief overlook at the product. And of course, if any of you do have any questions, do feel free to reach out to us and we will answer them as best as we can. But Thank you very much. Throw that, throw that back to you, Martin. Thank you, that was great. Thanks a lot. Okay, let me go back to my screen. Um, hopefully that can be seen, yes. So yes, thanks Luke. Um, hopefully as Luke said that, that gives you a, a presentation, a tongue in cheek look at uh, the things not to do. Um, obviously invert those and make them the things to do and you'll obviously have a much more successful project. So I think we're actually ahead of time, which is a surprise. So thank you very much for uh, coming along today. Do please get in touch if you have any questions. And if we, anyone's got any questions at this time, holler and we'll uh, have an open chat. Uh, Jessica, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, yep, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, so this um, product of yours mm -hmm. um, is for things that are more like one-time migration. So like for me, for example, I'm working on the business case to go from on-prem to cloud for our dynamics yeah. instance. So I get that it can be used for that. But yeah. once we're in the cloud, um, so we are implementing HubSpot at the minute. And for now, yeah. whilst on-prem, we're keeping them separate. But yeah. is this the sort of application that can be used to for continual sync? So I'm yeah. going to have to work out how to keep HubSpot and CRM up to yeah. date and integrated and, yeah. you know, it's the master and the slave for bits and bobs. So is yeah. this, can this do that? Yes, definitely. Awesome. Uh, you might you might remember the um, that use case for the hospitality client, yeah. where we migrated their data in the first place, and we've actually got uh, you know a few clients doing this, uh, migrating from on prem to online, and mm -hmm. then they want to integrate between multiple systems and keep them in sync. Yeah. So yeah, first first pass is migrate, and then largely it's integrate. So yeah, definitely something that can be done. Yeah. So with, with the migration, um, I know on one of your use cases there, you had, um, uh, was it MuleSoft? Yeah, as MuleSoft. As yeah, that's a, a, an, it's an ETA, it's not, a, it's an enterprise service bus. Yeah, because we would probably be looking at using something like Kingsway Soft or Scribe, but mm -hmm. alternatively, this, could I throw this into yeah. play? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, they're, they're both obviously well-known products. This is an yeah. alternative to those two products which adds um, the whole data quality piece and the whole master data management piece and, and the integration that we'd like to think is, is done well. Um, but yeah, they're, they're well-known and well-used products. 
yeah. this is but an alternative this is, approach. And, yeah, this is an alternative and yeah. do you, because with like Kingsway so often inscribed they have um or my understanding is that they they kind of think the table up you have to sorry Jessica I just lost that is it um so with the uh Kingsway Soft or Skype I think definitely with Kingsway my internet connection have you am I, am I still here yeah I'm still there but it's a bit, okay, yeah, a bit we'll jerky there Jessica for a minute message. we're getting every other word Jessica unfortunately <laughs> So with with um, those other tools, they have like pre-built scripts written because it knows that data from this table then relates to data from that table, yeah. for example, on yeah. prem to cloud. Um, yeah. Do you have those sort of pre-existing relationships pre-programmed? Yeah, so you, can, well? you can literally auto map. If the field names are the same, you literally press a button and they'll auto map and they'll be identical. You can alias them so that you can. Um, make that happen automatically once set up yeah. and as Luke mentioned along the way there is a new feature where we've actually allowed you to map those outside of the product create a create an excel file or whatever export it to csv bring it in and then that becomes your map so it saves you know hours on end of, of mapping time so yes yeah, fantastic okay lovely thank you very much thank you anybody else with any questions Emma, looks like we might have come to the end of the questions. Yeah, there's nothing else in the chat. So, um, yeah, I think that they're all um, all silent. <laughs> all right. Well, we've either, we've either stunned you or bored you, one of the two, hopefully uh, hopefully the former. Um, yeah, look forward to the feedback in the, uh, in the feedback response and um, somebody might win a nice bit of Lego. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin and Luke. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, if everybody would like to unmute and give them a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Don't forget to fill in your feedback forms. Um, the session recordings will be available on the YouTube channel and on D365UG um, probably in the next few days, um, so you'll get uh, reminded of that. Um, there are three more sessions at 2.30, so you've got a little bit of time to grab a drink if you want to do that. Um, and thank you very much for attending. Thanks, everybody, and see you for real sometime soon. Bye thank for now. You.